On the level of principles and on the level of historical realities, Islam's relationship with the people of the book, those revealed re religious traditions that are orthodox in their nature, has been by and large resolved. It has been a positive one. Uh, history testifies to that. Now, when we look at today's world, when we look at the modern age, with the advent of modernity, things have changed. How do we realize, how do we know who are the people of the book? What, what ought to be the criterion, a yardstick, to know what are the limits of definition of people of the book? Can we say that today's Jews and Christians constitute the communities of the people of the book of Ahl al-Kitab as they did back in the days of the Prophet. And here there are several thorny issues that arise that an automatic association with, of the West with Christi Christianity, for example, um, should be avoided. If we take a look at four different types of uh, Christianities that exist in the world, uh, it will be clear. Let's take the example of the European Christianity first, then we'll look at the American Christianity, then Latin American Christianity, and then last of all, the Eastern Christianity, and see how we can actually see whether who constitutes the position of the people of the book. In, the Euro in Europe, uh, Christianity itself is the weakest. In the Mediterranean era, er, area, it is still more prevalent. Catholicism is more prevalent there, but in the Lutheran areas and in Northern Europe, it has weakened. It has weakened the most in the Northern European areas of Scandinavia. If we look at North America, we see the fundamentalist Christianity, besides Catholicism and other religious, uh, other groups belonging to Christian world are in full swing. They have a concatenation with politics, they have a distinct worldview, and uh, they no longer uh, can be restrained by the checks and balances that the papal authority would impose on them. In South America, in Latin America, uh, the Christian world is still integrated in uh, more of a traditional uh, uh, Catholicism, but uh, the uh, evangelical movements in South America are making a major headway these days, especially in Argentina and Brazil. Um, now, if we turn to the Oriental Christianity, we get a different picture, especially those Christians that are living still inside of the Middle East and other Oriental countries uh, continue to be more or less uh, more traditional Christians, especially if they're belonging to the Orthodox and Catholic traditions. Now, if we take the same example towards Judaism, and we see who are the Jews today. Uh, can we make an automatic association of Israel and the Jewry? Uh, can we look at the position of the Orthodox Jews on the notion of political Zionism? Is political Zionism the equivalent of biblical Zionism? These are some major questions, some big questions that prompt us to look at um, that the West itself is not an automatic uh, representation of uh, Christian doctrine. This association of Christianity with West uh, it should be taken minimally. The reason for that is that due to secularization in the Western world, uh, the Christian world has been deeply impacted. The secularism of uh, Eastern and Western European nations have also impacted the political life and the social life of the uh, Ashkenazi community that lives inside of Israel in case of the Jews. No longer the Christians are sure whether God is male or female. Some Christian churches have insisted in calling Christ Christa. Uh, these things uh, make the Muslims take a fresh look at the Christian world itself with somewhat confusion uh, that they cannot really uh, approach the modern Christians as, as 
as they used to approach the traditional Christians, it is increasingly becoming difficult for Muslims uh, who are still Muslims in a sense that Christians are not Christians anymore to talk to the modern Christians. On the basis of what can the Muslim talk to the Christians? If the scriptures are no longer valid, if Reformation has gone to such an extent that the whole idea of divinity itself is being questioned. <laughs> now if we take a look at the Eastern traditions, if we go outside of Abrahamic world and take a look at the Eastern traditions, um, Muslims themselves have to ask the questions, do the Eastern religion con can constitute as people of the book or not? What ought to be a yardstick on defining people of the book? Like I said earlier, uh, orthodoxy is one of such yardsticks. Uh, the importance of revealed religious tradition that the Quran has mentioned that we have sent, God said, that we have sent 124,000 prophets across different spheres of time and space. And all of the people throughout history and today's world have received the message of God. Does that mean the people who belonging to the Buddhist world and people who belonging to the Hindu world be included as people of the book? Many throughout the Muslim history who have emphasized and learned the Unitarian teachings of the Eastern traditions have thought so. But especially in the modern times with exclusionary exclusionary uh, politics, uh, in exclusionary worldview, uh, narrow-mindedness in religion have actually prompted many Muslims not to do so. The last thing that, that should be mentioned in this regard is now are uh, the people of the book, whoever they may be, whether Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists and so forth, um, a dialogue with them, is it possible or not? If it is possible, it is possible on what grounds? Is it possible on theological grounds or is it possible on only on the political plane? And here it is important to mention that, uh, to take the example of the Abrahamic tradition and the Western world, that the interfaith dialogue with the Christian world or the Jewish world is not the same thing as Islam and West dialogue. Islam and West dialogue has within it the political realities and a huge power differential, whereas the interfaith dialogue offers tremendous potential for interfaith harmony and understanding our common origin. Now, within Abrahamic tradition, when it comes to uh, the Jews, the realities that beset the Muslim world today are further compounded by the state of Israel. We have to ask the question, that is, is the biblical Zionism the same thing as political Zionism? Is political Zionism biblically warranted? Can we, can we treat the Ashkenazi Jews who are secular and more and more hardly Jews at all be compared to and taken as valid Jews like the Sephardic Jews or the Orthodox Jews. This further opens up the question of interfaith dialogue uh, with the West itself. The interfaith dialogue between Muslims, Christians and Jews or for that matter other political and religious communities the same thing as the Islam and West dialogue. In the Islam and West dialogue we find the hard political realities the power differential and uh, a to more or less a total uh, difference of uh, power between the Muslim world and the Western world, but in religious dialogue there are so many avenues that can be explored. There are so many things that can be talked about commonly. There are scriptures on the basis of what, on the basis of which there are possibilities of shared identities and shared worldviews. Finally, uh, one must say that the real battle today is not between Christian Muslims and Jews, even though it may seem as if it is. The real battle today is between secularism and religion, is between materialism and insistence on spiritual realities. And here I think that most of the religious communities uh, have a chance to make a difference. Interfaith dialogue and harmony can bring them together and have fetters on materialist ideologies that have so, caused so much disruption in the world in the last 200 years. 
The question of Islam and other religions today is a very important one. It impacts the life of Muslims all over the globe. And it is important to know this issue at a theological level and also at the historical level so that we can see what the contemporary relevance for this subject is. At the theological level, it is very clear in the exhortations of the Quran that we have sent 124,000 prophets across different spheres of time and space. This leaves no ambiguity uh, in the notion that Islam accommodates all other religious traditions. All of other religious traditions that are revealed scriptures are considered the valid paths of salvation according to God. At the level of history, we see that the Islamic civilization has known many other religious civilizations remarkably. Within the Darul Islam itself, we find the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Zoroastrians, the Buddhists, and so many other religious traditions that have incubated and prospered and flourished within Darul Islam itself. And this is not just uh, due to the mere uh, sentimental tolerance of other religious traditions, but the observance of Muslims as a direct commandment of God. Now this itself is supplemented by the ethos of the Prophet. What the Prophet did with other religions, how he accommodated other religious traditions, how he implored the Muslims to understand many other religious traditions, how he formed his matrimonial alliances and married across the religious traditions is an example for Muslims to follow. The message of Islam in the light of Muslims' values and beliefs is conclusive. This is the last religious traditions according to Muslims and no other prophets will come after this. At the same time, it is very important to remember that although the message of Islam is considered conclusive by Muslims, it is not really exclusive only for Muslims. The message of Islam is conclusive and it is inclusive. It involves the ethos, it understands and accepts the ethos of many other religious traditions. They're exemplars, they're spiritual leaders, and all of those elements are represented in the Prophet. There's a hadith by the Prophet that to honor an old man is to show respect for God. Now the Prophets have also been old men, but they haven't been regular old men, but a lot more than just old men. Even if you transpose this hadith of the Prophet to the respect of other Prophets, one must always keep in mind that it is incumbent in the light of Islamic tradition, in the light of Hadith, in the light of Quran, it is incumbent, incumbent upon Muslims to respect the other prophets. A pious Muslim never denigrates other religious traditions. A pious Muslim never denigrates other, other prophets. To insult other religions amounts as an insult to God. This essentially, in a nutshell, is the position of the Prophet, the ethos of the Prophet in approaching other religious traditions. These days, a position held by many Muslims that Islam is an exclusively valid path of salvation for Muslims alone is errant. It is in complete departure from the traditional position of Muslims in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah.